I'm Professor Bonnie Wade in the uh, Department of Music here. Uh, we are co-sponsoring the Regis Lectureship with the Institute for South Asia Studies. Thank you. Well, you're welcome. Thank you for coming. It is a gift. <laughs> um, today, uh, we're going to concentrate really on Hindustani music, the tabla in Hindustani music. Last Thursday, you heard uh, him speak about his childhood, the very eclectic uh, experiences of childhood and his education and, and that kind of thing. Uh, today we really are going to focus on, on the music because we have one of the world's great musicians in our presence. Um, and I want to do this in three parts. First I want to focus on the tabla in history, and by history I mean history, <laughs> long time back. Um, and then I want to talk about the tabla in Hindustani uh, ensemble practice, which uh, involves uh, various kinds of music and involves the tabla player as an accompanist in the ensemble. Um, Bynum will come to the tabla as a solo instrument, um, the musician as the soloist. And he has seen so much in his lifetime of um, 64 years. And I would say, <laughs> wouldn't you, that no, this gives you credence as a historian. Hey, you got to be old to get credence? <laughs> <laughs> Don't ask me that. <laughs> There was a band called Credence Clearwater. Yes. <laughs> they got Credence. They got platinum records, too. Uh, I mentioned the 64 years because it has spanned quite a bit of change in Hindustani classical music. And um, he has lived it and remembers what happened from three days um, of age when his father, you've heard the story, when his father whispered prayers in his ear that were tabla bowls. And so he has literally lived 64 years of Hindustani music. Okay, can we start? Yeah, yeah? absolutely. Okay, first the focus on the tabla historically. All right. As you are quick to point out, the tabla in Hindustani classical music is only 30 odd, 300 odd years old. Yeah. Right? In your you, uh, don't quote me on it because there's no documentation actually saying that it's about that old. Well, <laughs> uh, in your region's lecture last Thursday, you spoke to its history. Uh, you're in for it. Um, it's going to be fun. Yeah, I hope so. You spoke to its history as part of the musical influence from the Persian culture in the Mughal period, particularly in the 18th and 19th century, when several stringed instruments were also invented, such as the sitar and the surbahar and some others. Now, I can add to that comment of yours that I, from my own research on Mughal miniature paintings, that at the Mughal court, the most prominent drums were the West Asian nakara, mm -hmm. the bowl-shaped drum, and also the Indian akavaj, which is an um, elongated and modified barrel sort of drum that is quintessentially an Indian drum. There is also pictorial evidence in Mughal uh, period paintings that drum pairs mm -hmm. of several shapes bowl shaped, cylindrical shaped as well, other shapes, that they were in use particularly in regional courts mm -hmm. outside that central Mughal court. And in a PhD thesis for UCLA in 1974, ethnomusicologist Rebecca Stewart, who traced the history of the tabla, concluded that the tabla we know is a hybrid instrument. That left hand drum, um, thank you. <laughs> uh, is a bowl-shaped nakara, in essence, uh, combined with the right-hand drum, which is a greatly reduced and also <laughs> modified pakavaj. Yeah. Oh. So it's a hybrid instrument. 
the first pictorial evidence she found for that particular drum pair was a painting of 1707 by an artist who had left the Central Mughal court and moved to a regional court. Mm -hmm. Now, my question takes us beyond the physical drum to the use of the drum in Hindustani music. I would like to hear what your understanding is of how tabla got involved in ensemble practice. In an ensemble? In ensemble practice, yes, specifically okay. ensemble practice. How did it get established as a regional instrument? Um, I think, well, Pakawaj, as I was saying on Thursday, Pakawaj was the instrument of choice for Dhrupad performers and bean cars who performed in those days playing Ruth Ravina uh, uh, or just any kind of uh, old uh, string instrument that uh, was used to perform music that was based on Dhrupad style of uh, singing. Uh, later on, uh, and I think it had a lot to do with the influence that came from uh, uh, the Persian world or the Turkish world where Sufi uh, elements came into play. Uh, uh, the instruments that they were using in, 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 the, in the, uh, that part of the world were setar or, uh, or uh, like, a, like a bazooki, uh, um. yeah, different kinds of uh, like mandolin type instrument or lute type instruments which had long necks as well mm -hmm. and, uh, and, and maybe that may have had something to do with inventing instruments similar uh, which were a combination of that as well as a combination of veena. Uh, there are musicologists in India who believe that uh, instruments like surbahar or sitar or saroda, ancient instruments and ancient in the sense that these were developed based on the shape of the bow. Bow and arrow, when you look at the bow. And then you look at, say, a sarod. You find that the body is representing that kind of a shape with the string on top. We go 20,000 years back in the caves in south of France, and you have uh, paintings which depict a bow-like instrument, which could commonly is, is commonly known as a birimbau, coming from Brazil and, and places like that. So it is quite uh, easy to presume that uh, musicologists believe that that was. Uh, the foundation of what instruments like sitar and sarods were. Uh, I believe that it, it was definitely uh, a hybrid of, of Persian in, and uh, Hindustani cultures coming together. Mm -hmm. Turkish, Persian, Hindustani cultures coming together and the instruments that were dominantly uh, used in, in the Persian culture and Hindustani culture were, were fused together to create hybrid like tabla you know, which is a hybrid, as you mentioned, Pakawaj, and uh, a bowl-like instrument. Uh, those long, uh, sort of cylindrical stand-up instruments. You sure they weren't garbage disposal? <laughs> <laughs> I hope not. <laughs> but anyway, uh, so, bowl-like instruments. I believe that Dukkar, which is uh, like a jodi instrument, a, a bigger form of tabla, uh, came from uh, war drums. And the reason why I say that is because in the Arabic world, when you look at the word for war drum, it is tabal. Tabal. Not tabla, but tabal. So when you have a war drum like a kettle drum, which is a big, bowl-like instrument uh, mounted on either side of the camel or the elephants or the horse to be you know, played sounding the charge or the retreat or whatever else that needs to happen. Uh, 
at that time. So from there, uh, I believe the word uh, double was used for drums, and then that was used to be able to be like more like a map for a smaller version. Uh, because as I was saying on Thursday, uh, musicians were not allowed to sit in, in the presence of royalty, so they had to stand and play. So they needed to have instruments that were small enough for them to stand and play. Darbuka is one such instrument which they could just hang around the neck and play. Uh, uh, there are other instruments in Sri Lanka uh, uh, which are two-headed two drums which you put around your neck and you play with sticks. Uh, uh, those may also have been in some ways uh, 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 inspired by the fact that they had to be played in front of the royalties. Uh, and, and when you look at those instruments from Sri Lanka, they have a higher end and a lower end, played with the sticks, curved sticks. And uh, so it's possible that those were also in some ways used as, you know, uh, 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 models for tabla, along with the kettle drums, along with dhukar, the Punjabi uh, uh, jodi instrument. And, and so the tabla emerged, and so uh, I feel that uh, when that happened, when the sitar or the sarud or the sarangi and such instruments emerged, Ravanhatta is another instrument from Rajasthan. It is, uh, what, a three-string uh, wooden small board instrument that's still played in, in the gypsy world, in the folk world. Uh, it is believed to have been the predecessor or father of the Sarangi. So Sarangi also has three strings, Ravadatta had three strings, gut strings uh, on both instruments. The difference is the Sarangi was developed and refined and sympathetic strings were added to be able to give it a kind of resonance that uh, made it possible for the Indian classical music to be performed on it. Uh, so. Uh, these are examples of instruments coming together <coughs> due to, uh, you know, uh, injections of both traditions or multi-traditions. So when these things happened, the music also started to change. Uh, they say Amir Khusro. Now there are, by the way, historically speaking, two Amir Khusros. Uh, uh, I tend to believe it was the second one, if at all. Uh, Amir Khusro uh, took Kol, Kalbana, which, which are elements of present-day Kawali, the Sufi element, the Sufi music, Kol and Kalbana, and, and fused it with Prabandh Gaiki or Dhrupad, which is, the, or Haveli Sangeet, the music that came from the temple, and uh, used the same raga structures, but the way of singing, those, that music, that shari or that poetry that came from Rumi or, or Shirazi or, you know, poets of Persian world of that time, uh, it was more uh, Arabic style, more uh, uh, gypsy-oriented Arabic style of singing. So it took a little while, but those two coming together uh, going from straightforward note to note uh, singing of Drupad Arabic world, you yeah. do have these 
technical abilities to be able to create gamakas, as we call them. And so when you combine the, the two styles of singing, uh, that's where emerge another style called khayal. So khayal is what is now the dominant North Indian classical form, which all the singers of North India, all the instrumentalists of the North India perform. Khayal. So it's a hybrid, it's a secular form, which combined Prabandagai ki Dhrupad singing of the temples to uh, call Kalvana Kawali of the Sufi elements and created this style. It's interesting that we have this in, in North Indian music. So uh, when that happened, obviously the instruments also arrived which could best express that particular style. So therefore the sarangi or the sarod, not, not sarod as much, but sarangi, uh, the bean, uh, um, sursingar, surbahar, these were the first to arrive. Sitar and sarod were a little bit later. Uh, some people say sarod was uh, directly developed from the rabab, which is again a string instrument lute like from Afghanistan. but. Uh, I'm not sure if that is really the case because when you look at an instrument like Sursingar, it has a sarod like shape uh, and the skin, and, and, but it's much bigger, like the Surbahar is bigger. So when these instruments arrived and the music was performed on these instruments, it became very clear that the folk drums, like the Nagara or the Dhol or the Dholak, were a little too crude as an accompanying instrument for that kind of music, while the pakhawaj was a little too grand uh, and a little too opulent to be a subordinate accompanying instrument for this kind of music. And they needed to be able to come up with an instrument, a percussion instrument, that uh, sort of combined those elements and, and, uh, and was technically speaking uh, uh, versatile enough to be able to accompany not only the classical element of it, but the folk element of it, the Sufi element as well, everything. And so they took those, I mean, so the hybrid, as you say, emerged with the bowl and the wooden instrument from the Bakawaj and Tabla came into play. Who thought of the actual shape of it or the way it was going to be? I have no clue, no idea. Uh, uh, somewhere, there was somebody who definitely miniaturized it, seeing the cattle drums and the dhukkar and stuff. And so we have tabla. So tabla then became slowly and gradually the instrument that found its way into being the, instru the rhythm instrument of choice to accompany ghazals, accompany kajri, chaiti, tumri, all the folk elements of that time, and all the romantic elements of that time. Uh, Rupert wasn't necessarily uh, highlighting the romantic element of, of, when I say romantic, I mean Shringar element. Uh, there is romance in the music it's, and, and, and its history and tradition, yes, but in the Shringar element. Uh, but the Pakhawaj would have difficulty in being able to help express that. And when that brings me to also to tell you that Tabla is an expressive instrument. It emotes. It's, it's an, it, it expresses emotion as well. So that's why tabla was invented to be able to be the rhythmic accompaniment for this newly emerging style of music, khayal, and all the new instruments that were developing in the courts. And and, and I think to some extent the instrumentalists and the singers of that time felt a little bit you know, on the periphery uh, as of acceptance due to the already established Drupa. Mm -hmm. So they felt the need to be able to uh, develop amongst themselves, uh, you know, the music in a way that they could present it as an art form in the courts. And so it took a while, it took over 100, 150 years for that to happen. And only, say, in the 
middle of the 18th century or so, Khayal uh, actually started to find prominence as, as a performance art form in the courts. And, uh, and so therefore I was saying the other day that it was only like about 150 years ago that tabla actually became a prominent rhythm instrument. Thank you. Um, and then also relating back to your lecture on Thursday, you mentioned groups of tabla players. Uh, you mentioned the Benares group, Farukabad, Punjabi, a couple of others. And you didn't have time on Thursday to talk about these groups as groups. Um, I would appreciate it if you would comment on how these groups emerged as groups. Do you have a historical sense of how that happened? Uh, I will honestly tell you, my feeling is, or me myself as a musician, I don't necessarily uh, you know, endorse uh, the Karana system. Uh -huh. Interesting. And, uh, uh, yes, but don't tell anyone else. <laughs> this will be on YouTube, you know, by the time you leave the building. <laughs> okay, I don't necessarily endorse blip, 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 blip system. <laughs> uh, because in today's world, I don't think that applies in today's world. Uh, uh, as I mentioned Thursday, that music developed in pockets, in areas which were in some ways isolated due to lack of travel, trade, whatever you might want to call it, being a village. I mean, you, you go to Farukkabar, you can't even find it on the map these days, a little place like that, you know, or you go to Meerut, I mean, it's a small suburb of Delhi of some kind. In the meantime, there's this big school of Tabla in Delhi. Now, why everybody thinks that there are schools, I have no clue, but I believe as a student of Tabla, I felt the need that I needed to belong that I needed to lend a certain amount of importance and credence or validity to what I was learning or what I was practicing. And to do that, I needed to be able to glorify the roots or the source of what I was learning. So it became important for me as a student to say, you know, it's like, you know, my car is bigger than yours. My house is bigger than yours. My guru is more, more fabulous than yours. My guru can play the Rela 15 million BPMs per minute and 18 minutes longer than your guru can. You know, I mean, it, it may have been something as trivial as that, as silly as that. But, the, but when you have somebody who becomes a source of inspiration, uh, a star, if you will, for lack of a better word, in a small village, and he's considered the master. You see it in those karate movies, you know, <laughs> Kung Fu Master and, you know, whatever, or, you know, and, and they have little things like that. Anyway, so, I have to say that that may have been the reason why a certain elevation of a certain personality took place the first time. Maybe it was Delhi because the mobile courts were Delhi, everybody came to Delhi, uh, everybody played in Delhi. If you got your first nod from the king from Delhi, you made it. So it was like Venice or, you know, Austria or something like that. Uh, so then, so it is possible that the person who appeared to have become very popular, loved and revered and honored at, in those initial times uh, in Delhi was a tabla player of incredible uh, uh, talent and reputation and people were following him 
And so when they followed him, what he taught and what they learned and performed became that, a specialized system, a style. And uh, in order to be able to give it the strength of unity, the strength of, of longevity, something like that, uh, students uh, called it Gharana. And uh, because it, I, I belong to this house is better than saying I studied with this person. It, you, it has a sense of connection to some root or source, psychologically speaking. So I believe that the, the word karana emerged that way. It's not necessary that the master himself initiated the idea, but master himself actually enjoyed the idea when it happened. <laughs> <laughs> Who wouldn't? I mean, you know, I would. <laughs> and enjoyed that idea when that happened. So the gharana was formed. But there were other quotes in other parts of India where music traveled. And uh, so the, um, the Lucknow king said, okay, they have all these great musicians playing all this interesting music. And you know, the king has it and all that. Why can't I have it? You know, it's like, why can't I have the next Rose Royce or something? So lo and behold, musicians were found, brought to that part of the world, whether it was Rampur or Ranchi or wherever courts existed. And they develop. Now, I have a story. The story is this. One of the masters in Punjab had a daughter. And the daughter was of marriage age. So, in those days, musicians, families married among musicians. I mean, that's what happened. So, a boy was found who was from another music family, but he happened to be from Lucknow. So, marriage was arranged, son-in-law, the whole people came, marriage took place. Now, the, in those days, the maestros who were court musicians, they, they weren't getting like big salaries or anything, but they were getting like, okay, 50 kilos of rice, 30 kilos of whatever else, he, everything was provided for. And once in a blue moon, if uh, the king felt like it, he would give a velvet uh, bag of coins, you know, as, as a reward or something for great performance. So that's what happened. So they didn't really have lots of wealth to speak of. So what do they do? They have to give dowry. So the great master gives to his new son-in-law a dowry of 500 compositions known as Lahori Gat. Now this is documented fact. Uh, Lahori Gats, we play them. We call them Lahori Gats and we play them. So the young man takes that and his new bride and brings it to Lucknow. Okay, but he also has an ego. He also wants to be an individual, a performer of his own ability. So he takes those 500 compositions and he, you know, retunes them a certain way, finds a different element in each one of them and presents it and performs it, okay? Now suddenly something that's played a certain way is being played a little bit differently in Lucknow. And now this young man, gains prominence as a player who has a lot of knowledge, a lot of information, and d gains followers, gains followers, gains followers. And suddenly, his followers say, we belong to this karana. Mm. And suddenly, there's Lucknow karana. And so the chain reaction and effect, Lucknow to Banaras and so on emerges. Bade Ram Sahaji from Banaras karana came to Lucknow and studied with Siddhar Khan's grandson. And then when he finished his studies with him, he, took, he went back to Banaras, became the musician there, and took elements of Bhakti Rasa 
from the temples of Banaras using shlokas and stuff as another added element of performance in Tabla and, and developed something called Banaras Karana. So all this happened, but the root, the basic A, B, C, D of Tabla emerged where it emerged. It just mutated a shade when it moved on somewhere else and, and those great stars who mutated it a bit became the keepers of that particular style due to the reverence uh, and adulation of their students. So gharanas. So I, that's the way I believe it to be. Now that may have been true in those days. But today when we are traveling all over the world, we are listening to every tabla player under the sky. We are listening to all sorts of recordings of old masters, new masters, whatever, and seeing videos and stuff. It is impossible to be able to not be influenced and not be inspired uh, to uh, expand my way of playing. I will be the first to admit that you know I, I was just giving a lecture in Mumbai about gharanas and uh, they had gharana lecture seminar in January in Mumbai based on and, and focusing on sitar gharanas. So they listed in their book nine sitar gharanas, nine. I didn't know that there were more than three or two, <laughs> but there were nine gharanas listed. So. Lo and behold, the first day I had the welcoming or the keynote speech, I finished my speech and, and I said exactly what I just said. I don't necessarily believe in it. I have no clue which Vyakarana I belong to. I'll explain that later. But uh, the first sitar maestro was introduced, Ustad Usman Khan of uh, Tharwad Gharana. And, and he came and he sat down. And he said, ladies and gentlemen, I am very thankful to you all and to the convener for finally inventing Dharwad Karana. <laughs> That's exactly what he said. Those were his words, the man from Dharwad, the man representing supposedly Dharwad Karana. He said, I did not imagine that there was Dharwad Karana. And then he went on to explain exactly what he thought. So, so this is what I mean by gharana thing happening. Coming to me, I look at my father, my teacher, Ustad Allah Rakhaple. And then I listen to the recordings of his guru, my grand guru, Mia Kadar Baksh. Heaven and earth, difference. The tone, the technique, the material, Everything, totally different. I listened to Pandit Kishan Maharaj of Banaras Gharana. Then I listened to Pandit Shanta Prashad of Banaras Gharana. Same, two of the greatest tabla players of, of all time. Belonging to one gharana. But if you listen to the recordings, you will have to say, no, 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 cannot be. They are two different gharanas. They don't sound anything like each other. Not their tone, not the material they play, not the balance of the sound, anything. Totally different. So, I mean, go back to the greatest of the musicians who lived in the Bay Area, Ustad Ali Akbar Khan. He and his guru brother, meaning the person who studied with his father, Ali Akbar Khan Sahib studied with Aladdin Khan Sahib, his father. And so did Pandit Ravi Shankar. So did Pandit Nikhil Banerjee. And you listen to all three of them totally different. The musicality different, their way of playing different, the raga selection different, everything different. Their approach to the whole music and, and even to the instrument, very different. But you cannot say the same thing about Ustad Vilayat Khan. When you listen to Ustad Vilayat Khan sahab, and then you listen to everybody in the tree, whether that's Raiz Khan sahab, Shujat, Nishat, Shahid Parvez, they all play exactly that way. 
the only kharana that I can tell that does that plays exactly that. Why is that? It is simply because somebody came up with an incredible style that became the bar. And everybody followed that. Sitar was never played like that before Vilayat Khan Sahib started playing it. Similarly, when you hear Sarod being played all over India and anywhere, you see the influence of Ustad Ali Akbar Khan. You don't see the influence of his father Ustad Aladdin Khan or Wazir Khan or Hafiz Ali Khan or anybody. You see the influence of Ustad Ali Akbar Khan universally. So, why is that? That's today. That's now. So, whether it's Shahid Parvez playing or uh, Budhaditya Mukherjee playing or uh, Niladri Kumar playing or Purvayan Chatterjee playing, they all following a particular style. They don't belong to that gharana. Niladri Kumar most certainly does not belong to Vilayat Khan Sahib's style of playing, but he follows it. It's not a question of gharana anymore. It's the question of what hits you here and what identifies you as a person and comes out. So that's what it is, me. I am a concoction of various gharanas. When I looked at my father and his teacher and I saw the differences, and I said, who should I follow? Should I follow my father's guru? Because that's Mr. Guru. <laughs> yeah, or should I follow my father who has moved it, you know, a slightly left of right? And uh, in my opinion, my humble opinion elevated it like a zillion times more. Should I follow him? What should I do? And this is the loophole that we have in Indian classical music. We are supposed to follow tradition. We are supposed to be true to what existed. But at the same time, we are supposed to improvise and come up with something new and fresh. How the heck are we supposed to do that? <laughs> So that's what I have to say about Karanas. That's, I mean, it. it yeah. Thank you. <laughs>Why they are garanas. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, I mean, I mean uh, someday I guess you're going to hear this. You, you're going to hear San Rafael Garana. <laughs> <laughs> I'm surprised we haven't already. <laughs> I'm surprised. I mean, Whatever location it is, it has to be in India. Yeah, yeah. I mean, the location has a, has a lot to do with it. I mean, you know, bring in trade, bring students in, they'll spend money, foreign exchange. <laughs> They come in here and spend rupees. <laughs> you might need it some. <laughs> well, so, so yes, one of the reasons, modifications are there. Yes, absolutely. Okay, for example, what would they modify? Well, let's go to sitar, for instance. I was talking about Ustad Vilayat Khan Sahib. Okay, somewhere along the line, uh, it's right behind you. There. Got it. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you. Okay. Yeah. Two of the most influential instrumentalists of Indian, of Indian classical music. No, it's fine. Put it on. Yeah. It. Oh, there it's it is. On. No, it's, it's okay. It's okay. It's fine. Two of the most influential instrumentalists of Indian classical music in the past 100 years are Ustad Ali Akbar Khan and Ustad Bilayat Khan. The reason I say that is because once in a blue, 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 blue year comes, comes a person who takes, you know, a moving, you know, almost moving tradition 
and gives it that little elevation and push to turn and, and, and come up with this incredibly new dimension to the music. Someone like Ali Akbar Khan Sahib, I was thinking the other day, was able to do that with the instrument Sarod. Sarod was never played like this ever before. And hopefully it will be played like this for a hundred years to come, before another Ali Akbar Khan emerges. Uh, the ability of the instrument itself, if you go back a hundred years ago, you have a Sarod that did not resonate as much. It did not retain the tone as much. It did not use the left hand to be able to utilize the meads and the gamaks and the krindans and zamzama, all these elements, as much. Mainly in those days, they relied on this, the pick or the jaba, as it's called. Why was that? It wasn't that they, can you bring, it wasn't that they couldn't find more nuances out of the instrument. It's just that in those days they didn't have microphones. Sound did not travel as much. So they had to, to play more here. And because if you're not gonna, if I'm gonna hold the note like this, you're not hearing it out there. But with the microphone on, is the microphone? On? Yeah. <laughs> if I did, then you hear. So that's one of the reasons why the instruments were played a certain way. In the 50s, the sound systems came into play a little bit more and people started to, uh, you know, find that they didn't have to, you know, physically stress so much. But by then, the maestros were getting old. They were too set in their ways. They could not change. They could not understand the nuances of the sound system. Then came three young musicians who were technically masters at their instrument, but they were young enough to be able to understand modern technology. And those three were Ustad Ali Akbar Khan, Pandit Ravi Shankar, Ustad Vilayat Khan. I would have to say, when it came to instrumental music becoming a stage entertainment performance art, these three are to be blamed <laughs> for it. The other ones who came up with the whole book, the how-to book, on how to perform this music. So, modifications were made. Uh, they sat with Hiren Roy in Kolkata, the Sarod maker or the sitar maker, Heyman, and tried, or Nodu Malik, and tried to figure out how to make the instrument uh, more deeper sounding, more rounder sounding, less sharp and edgy, uh, and, uh, and more responsive to a subtle plucking as opposed to hard plucking, various things like that. Uh, how, what kind of skin should sit on the sarod, uh, how thick it should be, uh, whether the skin should also resonate when, when, when the instrument is being played, uh, what number of strings should be used, number three, number four, uh, the, the, the low string, should it be double zero or what not. And, they all, and, and all this was done by these three gentlemen. And uh, they figured out a way. I mean, Vilayat Khan Saab kind of stayed a little bit true to the old sitar and did not use a low courage string which was a veena element. And he was playing sitar magnificently. Ravi Shankarji decided to separate from that idea. 
and be a difference in our play. So he found a courage string like the veena, the low string of the veena, and added that onto the sitar so that he had another octave available to him to go down to play more Drupad Ang Alap, Drupad style Alap. So he changed his way of playing, and, and there were a whole line of sitar players who followed that, and a whole line of sitar players who followed Vilayat Kansa. The difference was Ravi Shankarji decided that he would like to be true to the music, true to the raga and what it asked, and how it asked to be represented. So he played that on the sitar. Vilayat Khan somehow ever felt that he needed to explore the limits and the boundaries of the sitar, what it as an instrument could do. And he found other things to do on the sitar. Uh, five note tan on one fret was unheard of before him, and he found a way to do that. And uh, playing it in a way so that the sitar sounded like vocal music, not instrumental music, because it was not dependent on just the plucking anymore. You could pluck one note and then with the retention do all these other things. These were developments. These were modifications that were done. Similarly with the tabla. When tabla was earlier played, we had tabla playing like... Modifications were made in the kind of wood that we used from clay, which was the original shell, ceramic shell. We went to wooden shells and then eventually settled on metal shells. For now. What kind of skin, what kind of straps, how hollow the shell needed to be to maintain resonance how much it needed to weigh to be able to give it the kind of deep tones that you require. All those elements came into play because you didn't just and anymore do But you, you know, you dug deep and you went, you went. <laughs> yeah, you did that too. I did it again. <laughs> I think somewhere around 800 hertz needs to be minus a bit like Leonard. There's a resonance. Okay, so the tone came into play. The retention of the sound. So then we started to experiment with not just and we started to experiment with many different tones started to emerge. And then the baya or the bass drum wasn't just one open tone. It was melodic. It was a song. That doesn't mean that we actually played the notes, but can you turn the low mids and the low end down just a tad? Mm. This is very loud. Mm. Mm. <laughs> 
Okay. So, um, I guess the problem is I'm so far from the mic, you have to keep turning it up, correct? Should I speak in my operatic tone? <laughs> so, uh, you know what, let's just cut this out. The speakers are too close, they will, you know, let's just keep this on. So, uh, or just keep it at two. <laughs> Turn it down, take the low end out of this mic. Okay. Uh, see, you now have to also know how to control the sound system. <laughs> that all came into play, modifications. So, because you had tones, tones like that. You did not play it that way, you played the slide. So the resonance helped you to do that. Now you have emotions coming into play, modifications. Just bring this up a tad and take the low end down a little bit. So, if you wanted to express romance, even if you wanted to express anger, you might. If you wanted to express valor. you had tones, you had melody, you have expressive sounds available to you. Suddenly expansion of, of the whole vocabulary became. Dha was no more dha. Dha is a tone, right? But you used it differently. It's still dha, but to changing tone. But it's changing, expressive, uh, different shades. So all these different elements started to emerge uh, and modifications were made. And as I said, uh, tabla is a very young instrument, so it's still being modified. It's, we're still looking at what to do with it. There's almost 70% of Pakhawaj repertoire that is still to be brought onto this instrument. We still have to find technical ability to be able to import that information. So basically, on tabla, you're, you're hearing something like 30 to 35 percent of the repertoire of Indian rhythm traditions. Not all of it yet. Probably won't, not in my lifetime. We're still developing it. I had a, a concert on February 3rd in Mumbai in remembrance of my father. And I called a tablologist. Is that what we, we would call ourselves? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. You know, a rhythmist, a tablologist, something like that, from Punjab, to trace the history of the Punjab school and tradition and all that, and to talk about the compositions in chronological order and have them performed by students. So we did that. And uh, what emerged from that to me was that there were compositions that were brought by this gentleman, an older man, which I had not heard before. They belonged to the Punjab school, uh, compositions of an old maestro known as Baba Malan or Lala Bhavani Das in the early 1800s and stuff and so on. And I heard some of those and interesting thing was that the gentleman recited those compositions but they were not played on the tabla. And the reason why they were not played on the tabla was because no one had yet found a way to do it. <laughs> Technically the fingering technique and stuff on how to 
in, you know, printed onto the hands to be able to do justice to the, uh, to the composition. So all that still needs to be done, so there's much modification to come in the future. But music, in terms of how it's presented, the instruments, how they have developed, it's like from the first day the computer came to us, and in that space of time, whether it was 25 or 30 years, it went from here to there, the computer. Similarly, the modifications in the instrument, since the advent of modern technology, has also gone from way down here to way up there. And more to go, I hope. That Thank you very much. My pleasure. <laughs> Maybe move to part two? Oh, we still want our part one. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> but you have hinted at no. I doubt it. Um, <laughs> I can tell a joke or two. <laughs> um, moving to the instrument as an accompanying instrument and the musician as an accompanist. Well, it accompanies me everywhere. <laughs> Very good job. <laughs> Uh, let's move to the 20th century, uh, or stay in the 20th century, yes, you took us into that. So, when you were a young musician, <laughs> I'm not going there, we're not talking about that. You were There's a no young, 10 year period involved. <laughs> Perhaps I should say, when you were a younger musician, <clears throat> what was your idea about your job as an accompanist? Um, did you understand your role to be different depending on the type of music you were accompanying, vocal music or instrumental music? Uh, but let's start with vocal music. If you were accompanying a singer of Tayal, uh, which as you said is the predominant vocal genre, what would be your role? And you have certainly accompanied Tayal singers. But then I found among your recordings that two of the singers with whom you recorded sang Tarana a very different vocal genre from Cal. Those artists were Pandit Ajoy Chakraborty early on in 1989. And also that year, Ustav <coughs> Rashid Khan, he sang Tarama as well. In 1989 as well, you recorded with Srimati Girijadeva, Devi, and um, she sang yet another vocal genre, Tapa. So would you explain, uh, please explain the differences among those vocal genres and speak to how accompanying them asks you as a cover player to adjust what you will do? Okay. Uh, as a young musician, Younger. I was a little too <laughs> busy looking good. <laughs> I was just too busy trying to impress everybody. I just had to, you know, show off, and uh, it became an interesting point in my life when I was busy doing that and getting good reviews from the age of, say, 12 to about 16, and then getting one really bad one when I was 16. Uh, it says something like the young Saki Hussein uh, did his usual smile and fast riffs and and uh, sawal jawab and long tea highs and everything and uh, technically impressive uh, really had nothing much nothing to do with what was going on on stage musically. Uh, the statement that the main maestro was trying to make through his music. And uh, so this critic's observation is that uh, Mr. Hussein, the young Mr. Hussein, Master Hussein as they say, is, uh, uh, has not developed to the next stage. He has not found a way to be able to grow as a musician. Uh, in other words, it was uh, a scathing, 
uh, analysis of my playing made me very upset, very angry, and you know. And it was one of the students of my father who said, you know what, this may not be something that you like, but analyze this, see if this is true, if the guy is telling you the truth, if he's saying exactly what has happened. And if so, then find a way to be able to rectify it. So that next time that person hears you, he has to eat his words and, and, and uh, come back to liking you or whatever, or something like that. I started thinking about that. I started paying more attention to accompaniment, not me accompanying, but watching tabla players play. So I was watching tabla players play with vocalists. And the reason for that was because that required the most patience as a tabla player. That required most focus as a tabla player and also required the understanding of the repertoire its emotional content, uh, uh, its expressive element. It required all that because it wasn't just melody being played. There were words. And those words talked about things that, you know, related to daily life or r relationships. You know, things, you know, that that were relevant to, to, to our lives. Then I realized that I really had no clue, an in-depth clue, of what the musical repertoire was. And I started to think that if I don't learn anything about vocal music, I'm not going to take first step into being a good accompanist. So I started listening a lot to vocal music. I started going, they, one of the great maestros of Indian music, vocal music, Khayal, was Ustad Bade Ghulam Ali Khan, the great exponent of the Patiala school of vocal music. And my duty that I took upon myself at that time, and I was, what, 12 odd years old, 13 years old, was that on Sundays, when I was not going to school, my half day, I would go to his home. And I would sit there, and Ustad Bade Ghulam Ali Khansa was lying down on his settee, whatever that is, with his harp in his hand, like King Lear. <laughs> A big bowl of Amazingly tasty chicken legs. <laughs> A big bowl, I'm not kidding. You. Chicken legs. With all sorts of butter and ghee and masala all there. And he's, you know, all day long, this is what he did. He just sang. He just sang. Lying down and he just sang. And I would sit there with the tabla there. And if the mood was upon him to start singing a composition, he'd look at me, beta, and he sang it. And then I'd accompany him. And that was my job. For many hours a day, I would sit there, patiently waiting for him to look at me and say, play. But what was interesting was, in that period, I heard a zillion compositions. Tumris, Dadras, Jula, uh, 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 bhao uh, tumris, uh, bandishes of madhyale, band, khayal bandishes, bada khayal, chota khayal, all that, everything. And I listened to compositions of in all those ragas. And I started to identify ragas when I heard those compositions. That was very interesting for me. So I could, and I found a way to say, oh, okay, if it's this composition, I in a bala, it's You know, because 
I knew it was in Bhairavi, so that's Bhairavi. Mm -hmm. So started to identify all that stuff, listening to uh, singers. I was lucky that next door to us lived a singer of great, great talent in 1962-63. His name was Ghulam Mustafa Khan, who was a great singer. Uh, at the moment, he's the teacher of people like Hari Haran, Sonu Nigam, various singers who go to study with him. Uh, and he used to practice all day too. So when I came back from school, I'd jump in there. So now I wasn't just listening on Sundays to Patiala Garana and all the compositions and all that stuff coming down, but I was also listening to Rampur Sahaswan from Ustad Ghulam Mustafa Khansa. And I was accompanying him as well and, and, and learning. So it, I took it upon myself to really educate myself into the repertoire. And what it did, was it gave me some insight into the emotional content of our music. Up till that point, I was a tabla player who had my package number one, package number two, package number three, package number four. <laughs> and you know, and I'm playing rhythm and the sub sitar player is playing and I'm waiting. I'm not paying attention to what he's doing, I'm just playing rhythm and waiting for him to point to me and say, okay, you go. So then, depending on what tempo we were at, I had to unveil my package number two, <laughs> package number three. <laughs> <laughs> and audience will go. And then I'm like, okay, fine. <laughs> that was good. So, you know, that was the extent of my understanding of what Indian music was supposed to be. So that was changing when vocal music came into play. And, and I start, and, and it all changed because of that one critical review. And so, I have to say that if you want to be a very good accompanist as a tabla player, you must know what you're accompanying. You have to know. It's the same in any music. If you're a jazz drummer, you have to know all the standards so that you can play them right. You have to know all the chord changes so you know what the course is, and if, if, if the guy looks at you and says, okay, four, I mean four times around the course, so you're playing your solo, you know that you, exactly when you're supposed to come out of it and back to tempo time. You must know these things, so that's very important. So having learned that, I realized that what is the job of a tabla company? What is that tabla a company is supposed to be doing? What he's supposed to be doing is this. The way I understood it, my analysis, is that, that the tabla a company is a driver, is a chauffeur. And his job is to take the singer or the instrumentalist, whoever he's accompanying, in this beautiful car called Raga so and so with Bandish so and so, Tal so and so, all the wheels in place. And he's got to drive that person on that road, whether it's the road Jhaptal or road Rupaktal or road Arachatal or whatever. And you drive him avoiding all the potholes. <laughs> giving that vocalist or instrumentalist the smoothest possible ride from one end to the other end. And you arrive there, you make sure you coddle the person you are accompanying. And you provide him or her everything that they need to be able to express what the song is saying. What, what the emotional feeling of the, of, the, of the song is. If it means that you have to just play time, and for an hour just play time, if you're playing with Kishori Amonkar, mm -hmm. and you're playing just Teen Tal Cheka 16 beats for 50 minutes, then that's what you do, because that's what's required of you. I remember playing with Ustad Ali Akbar Khansa, the great instrumentalist, and most of the players felt that they needed to play with an instrumentalist, because you got a chance to play. Or with a dancer, you got a chance to play. But I've found situations where I've played a whole hour and 20 minute set with Ali Akbar Khan Sahib, just playing the rhythm. 
because that's all was needed. The great man was doing so much with the music that there was no need for me to push my wand in there and, and, and really mess things up. No need. <laughs> so you just play rhythm. So understanding your job as an accompanist is very important. You are the most important wheel in the whole thing. And that wheel is the steering wheel. You're the most important element in the car. The steering wheel, once you turn on the car and engine and everything, and you gotta steer this through, and you gotta make sure that you are there 100% for whoever you're playing with. And I learned that, and I learned tappa, and I learned trumri, and I learned dadra, and Chaiti and Kajri, if Shobha Guru sat there and decided to sing Jhula dheere se jhula wo banwari re saanwariya What was she saying? What was important about this? There was some request, some, you know, please in the singing. How do you express that? What kind of rhythm you must play, what kind of accent you must give, so that she feels the rhythm, she feels the groove, mm -hmm. and, and goes further with it. It's important. So that is what accompaniment is all about. One review did all this to me, changed my life, made me an accompanist. The other thing about being an accompanist is having the confidence to do less. Oh having the confidence to do less. <clears throat> you're not there to impress everybody with your tabla playing. You're part of a large picture. You're part of this canvas. Sometimes you're just the frame of the canvas. Sometimes you're the face in the canvas. Sometimes you're just the stand of the frame behind the canvas, not even being seen, but holding it up. Sometimes you're the thread that hangs it around the net, around the nail. So there are many ways to look at it, but the fact is the ability to be able to give in, the confidence to be able to do less, the knowledge of all layers of compositions and what they represent, it's very important to be an accompanist, I think. What do you think? It sounds good to me. <laughs> Are we going to question already or not? I just have a brief question about what you're speaking about. I, I've been to many of, of the concerts that, where you've been an accompanist, and, and in this country often you not not because you wanted to be necessarily, but you were the star. People were coming to hear you and how that impacted your work as an accompanist. Uh, again, confidence of being able to, uh, to do less. Uh, sometimes people just don't learn. <laughs> you know, it is true. They come to see you play and, you know, Every dog has his day, I'm the dog today, that kind of thing. And, and so when I'm playing with somebody, people come to hear me play and, and they're kind of like hanging on every phrase that I'm playing. Oh yeah, ooh, oh, fabulous. Ooh. You know, they're going nuts. They're, they're, they're peaking, right? But, uh, okay, you got it. Uh, <laughs> But it's up to me to be able to uh, not go with that flow. I have to still watch the gentleman or the lady I'm playing with. And I'm, but I cannot keep them from, you know, even a little thing that I do, which actually goes with what's happening at the moment, but because it's me doing it, Mr. and so and so and so, they're like, ah, yeah, about it. At times, you will sit in a connoisseur audience and the same thing will happen. They will applaud the subtle nuance that you have just injected into the scheme of things which has highlighted and visibilized what needs to be visibilized. And there will be a maestro sitting in the audience going, Wa beta, kya 
was, I mean, like, great son, well done. So that also happens. And, 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 and this is Indian music. I mean, it's like flamenco. People are allowed to go, ole, bravo, and everything. So that's part of it. But uh, it's up to me to be able to not get carried away in that and, and just do what needs to be done. But believe me, when you're playing a concert, whether you're accompanying somebody or, or a, a, accompanying a vocalist or an instrumentalist or somebody, you will have that moment where you can shine. Because this is a conversation. When you are playing with somebody, you're conversing. And so that person who you're accompanying also understands that somewhere along the line in the evening, there might be something that you might say that may put the exclamation mark to the whole statement. And, and as a tabla player, you are allowed that moment. So you are allowed to shine. So as long as you bide your time and you wait and you do that, you will have that moment and you will speak. But before that, uh, just you know, try not to show off. <laughs> yes, that was a very good question. Thank you for it. Shall we go on to part three? Part three. <laughs> <laughs> well, I think it would be nice any, to have time any, any Q and A. Dinner in part three. <laughs> <laughs> we can offer you coffee. <laughs> Not that coffee. <laughs> Did you guys drink the coffee here? <laughs> <laughs> Cruel man. Oh, yeah. <laughs> I mean, you want to make that coffee uh, ground go a long way, but I mean, <laughs> I mean all the way to the ground. Okay, double solo. Double solo. Yeah, for which you were so very famous. But I mean, how first... low can you get? <laughs> I didn't oh, say no. that. I'm not going there. Yeah, it stinks. Okay. Yeah. Looking back, okay. Um, as you know, that no, in 1976, a PhD thesis was written at Wesleyan University by Francis Shepard, uh, a student of Pandit Sharda Sahai yes. of Banaras Karana. Yes. He was also my teacher. Oh, yeah. I studied with him. I remember her and Bob Becker. Yes, oh, yes. Um, Francis Shepard's thesis detailed and analyzed the contents of a typical Banaras Garana soul, as, which is a sequence of different structural forms through which a player would display repertoire mm -hmm. of compositions and improvisational skills according to certain established expectations. Mm -hmm. My question, my first question, was there a format for a traditional Tabla Solo that the Benares Garana would have shared with players in other groups. Was there a kind of generalized idea of what a Tabla Solo would consist of? Uh, did everyone include the Kaida, the Peshkar? The well, uh, first of all, where did the tradition of Tabla Solo emerge from? It may not have emerged in Benares. And if that is the case, then maybe the question should be the other way around. Mm -hmm. Suppose it emerged in Delhi, then would they Oh, yes. Have... I don't think Francis Shepard uh, gave credit to Benares Garana uh -huh. for that solo tradition. Mm -hmm. She was just explaining the elements uh -huh. of what they do in okay. Benares as a solo tradition. Okay. All right. So, as I was explaining earlier, Bade Ram Sahaiji, the founder of the Benares Garana, came to Lucknow and studied in Lucknow. There's another interesting story about it. Remember I told you the story about the son-in-law, 500 Lahori guts, came to Lucknow. Bade Saram Sahaji came and he was learning with, with the maestro. And then the maestro for some reason had to go away, out of town for a little while. And Ram Sahaji used to come to the house and said, very like sad and head down and stuff, so Mrs. Maestro, who was known as BBG, went to him and said, Sharda, what's bothering you? What's your problem? You're very sad. So he said, 
Ustad is not here, Guruji is not here, I'm not learning anything, I'm very sad. What should I do? And I have to leave soon. So she said, oh, okay, well sit down. And then she taught him. <laughs> now in those olden days, ladies were not allowed to perform or learn, I mean, old societies. But nothing could keep them from listening while this was going on in the house, teaching going on. So they all learned a little bit about music or a lot about music depending on their interest in it. And so BVG at that point taught him 200 more compositions. <laughs> so even now, and this was mentioned by Pandit Kishan Maharaj in one of his lectures. He said even now there are Lahori guts and then there are 200 other guts which are now known as BBG Ki Lahori Gat. <laughs> <laughs> Meaning the Lahori compositions that BBG, Mrs. Maestro, taught. <laughs> and these are still played in Banaras, known as BBG Ki Lahori Gat. So, having said that, obviously the knowledge of tabla or the basic information of tabla a b c d <coughs> went according to national highway that was built by siraj Dola, i think no sher sasuri Shesha. 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 he built it right so it went from delhi through kanpur so therefore near lucknow out, and, and on the way past near Gawalia Agra and then all the way out near Patna, Ban Banaras, Mughal Sarai, Patna, out to Kolkata. That was the highway. So obviously the tabla traveled that way. If you look at it, you know, you've got Punjab, you've got Delhi, you've got Farakkawad, which is near Lucknow, Lucknow, Banaras. It went that route. Okay, so it was a national highway route, the trade route, the music travel, the musicians travel. So my feeling is that the basic information of tabla arrived a little bit mutated to uh, Lucknow, <coughs> further mutated to Farukhabad, further mutated to Banaras. So in the form that existed before, I look at tabla as movements, four movements. Nobody actually divided tabla into movements. I, I, not, I just, for my, my sanity, I say four movements. So the movements, the opening movement, which we call peshka. Now that palace that I had built saying, okay, the opening movement is peshka was just recently shattered. And I have to tell you why. That gentleman that I call from Punjab to trace the Punjab uh, tree, uh, chronological order, etc., etc., maybe I should not have done that, but I did. Uh, so he said, there's no such thing as Peshka. I said, ouch. I mean, I had built my whole tabla playing around Peshka. So there's no such thing as Peshka, what do you mean? He said, well, actually, what I mean is, that the peshka is the wrong word for it. It shouldn't be called peshka. What that means is in the palaces of the old, they used to call the gentleman who used to come out and read the minutes. Okay, what's going to happen today? So they say, call the peshka. <laughs> so a guy who presented the whole uh, the agenda. plan of action, the agenda, the the agenda yeah. was known as the Peshka. <laughs> it made sense because the artists, musicians, are known as Kala, two words, Kala as in art, Kar, Kala Kar, mm -hmm. presenter of art. So Peshka would be a presenter of Peshis of all sorts. Mm -hmm. uh, actor was Adakar. So what he was trying to say was that 
there is no such name for a particular composition. The opening movement should not be called Peshkar because Peshkar used to be this person who used to come and roll out the agenda for the king to do through the day. So that's how it was shattered, not for any other reason. Peshkar does exist. That form does exist. What is it? That form, mm -hmm. I believe, is the introduction of the vocabulary, the grammar, the pedigree, the lineage of what that student is who's presenting it. So, Peshkar in me, for me, is the meat or the main section of a tabla solo repertoire. The reason I say that is because it's the only part of the tabla playing which allows you to expand, improvise, and put together your statement, your expression of what it is. The other movement, which is the kaida or the theme and variations, is a composed theme and usually what a tabla student does is plays about 20 variations that have been taught to him by his teacher to play. So that's, in, 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 in a nutshell, a composed, organized presentation, the second movement. The third movement consists of recitation of compositions with, which have been composed by great masters of 100, 200, 300 years ago. You recite them and you reproduce them on the tabla. So that again is a composed element of tabla playing. I put the finale as, as the point where we play relas. Fast moving rhythmic patterns which represent running horses, rain falling, waterfalls, no matter, you know, different things that move at a very rapid pace. So you play those. Those do not necessarily call for improvising. Because if they were to be improvised, then they'd be the same as Kaida's. What they call for is the pattern to be moved in a graph showing the accents of the pattern, reversing of the pattern, moving the pattern upside down, etc., etc., but not improvising. So if you're doing one, two, three, four, 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 three, four, three, four, three, four, two, three, four, two, three, four, two, three, four, two, three, four, forward, forward. So that's what you're doing. That's Rayla. So you're just taking the pattern and you're accenting it, or you're going one, two, three, four, four, three, two, one, one, two, three, four, four, three, two, one, reversing it. And you're moving things around. So that's Basically, what you do with the Rela. Kaida is a whole different and the Rela, you practice those things. So I'm sorry? With the Rela, you practice those. You practice those. those yeah. So, for me, Peshkar is the main point of that explains what the person performing is all about. He introduces the rhythm cycle, he introduces the language of the instrument. He introduces the grammar of the language of the instrument and also introduces his ability to be able to build it. For me, a peshka is like, like taking a counter, for instance, a counter in the kitchen. Okay? So you lay out and then you put your granite in there. Or, you know, you just lay out the cement in it. Now you want to put tiles in there. So those tiles could be of different shapes. They could be round, they could be square, they could be triangular, whatever. And then those tiles have little drawings on it, little borders and whatnot, some faces or anything like that painted in it. Peshkar does all that. So if you have a basic fursh or floor of Peshkar, Trikadinna, 
Trekker denna, ta den denna. This is your floor den denna. Trekker denna, ta den denna. Trekker denna, trekker denna. Trekker denna, square tiles denna. Trekker den denna, den denna. Den denna, ta den denna. Trekker den denna, den denna. Den denna, square tiles. Trying to trick a din, 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 na, din, din, na, da, din, din, na, trick a din, 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 na, trick a din, na, triangular tile, circle tile, trick a din, 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 circular. I mean, I'm just saying, I'm. This is my vision of what the at least the first element of a peshkar is for me. So it's my vision of it as a tabla player. And, and, and then I'm going to create some paintings in it. Trick it in na, da, then, then, na. Trick it, then, then, na. Trick it in na, da, then, then, na. Trick it, trick it, then, then, na. Straight line. Trick it in na, da, then, then, na. Tag it, 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 of the repertoire, and I am juggling them, moving them, creating uh, all sorts of combinations and permutations from them. I am establishing my pedigree, and I am establishing my lineage as to the the powers that be who taught me how to do all this. So that's to me is the peshka, is 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 it establishes my identity with the people who are listening to. Me. So that happens, so Peshka. Then if you are in Delhi, and you're playing Delhi style, you would play six, seven, eight, nine Kaidas. Because Kaidas are the basic BAT bat, RAT rat, A, you know, so on and on of the tabla. And you, you play that in Delhi style. So that it that it that that it that it that it that it that it or that it again that it that it that it that it again that it again that it again different kaidas which are popular and you play those and you play the well-known variations of it and the people who are sitting in the audience go ah yeah 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 because they know those variations and and they know that they you know they're beautiful and they've been put together and they recognize it so it's an element that. Really, is an acknowledgement of certain rep part of a repertoire of tabla, and then you go to compositions and you say, "This is from Maestro so and so," and then you recite that. Composition, right? <laughs> You're speaking a language. You know, I've learned to express myself in English to you all. You know, I grew up speaking Urdu or Hindi, but I've learned to express myself in English. The key to becoming a very, very fine improviser of tabla or sitar or sarod or anything is learn to express yourself in that language. All you're doing is forming sentences, statements, paragraphs, whatever, and and you're speaking that. So if you can do that, that's very important. Like thagat 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 what did you do there? It's a question. So the Maya helps me to create that question. Where were you? What did you do there? Nothing much. I mean, the way you speak, that's how you will play. So the way you speak the language, that's how you will play. That's where the expression or the emotional content 
of the instrument emerges. So this kaida, so these forms have existed even before tabla. Even in Pakhavaj, you have the same forms. They exist. No kaida, because kaida is strictly a tabla thing, but other forms, whether it's the peshkar, whether it's the chan, whether it's compositions, whether it's relas, these exist even in Pakhavaj. So those forms are done in different parts of the country, in different styles, certain elements of those repertoires are highlighted. Like for instance, Lucknow Gat is an important element. And they focus on that. In Banaras, doing parals or, or uh, shloka oriented compositions are important. Right? Uh, in Punjab, uh, Paran is a very important part. Doing in intricate tihais, chakradars, gat, uh, those are important. Uh, Farukhabad, Merat, more uh, uh, Kaida combo with Rela is very important. So they all have highlighted certain elements. And that happened because the maestro involved decided that that's what he needed to do to be a different uh, style or school. So, or that's something that he could play better than anything else. <laughs> <laughs> no, it does happen. I mean, I know it's true. Like for instance, for me, uh, playing dera dera is 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 a difficult part. It's it's something that my hand uh, hasn't yet quite deciphered how to do. So, I mean, I do it, and a little, you know, it's not. I mean, it's reason reasonably okay. It's respectable, <laughs> but it's not fancy. Like say, Sabanji or uh, Anindo Bhai, I mean, these guys can, you know, scare the crap out of their <laughs> I mean, really, play, well, so, so there are people who do something very well, and they are known for that, and then that becomes their style. So the gharana emerges in that sense. Even though the gharana doesn't exist. Right. <laughs> Even though it's style, it's specialized. Yes. It's, style. Yes. it's like that ninth sitar gharana. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, I have uh, one question that I also am being very selfish about asking. <coughs> about I'm glad you weren't asking any questions. <laughs> <laughs> then I think we can open it up um, for you to have an opportunity to ask questions. Providing they're all as good as that question. <laughs> yeah, really. I'm kidding. Okay, you don't laugh when I make a joke. <laughs> Just laugh when he makes a joke. He wasn't planted, was he? <laughs> <laughs> no, I'm talking about you. <laughs> okay. Obviously, uh, the tabla solo has changed through time, as you explained technologically. Mm -hmm. The drum allows you to do different things. But one change that I've observed, and I would really appreciate your comment on, and that is in the old days, a tabla solo would be accompanied by an instrument that would keep the ta, mm -hmm. the metric cycle. The ta would be articulated on a melody producing instrument. I'm not telling you that in case there's anyone here who doesn't know this. Um, uh, the ta would be articulated on a melody producing instrument, usually a sarangi, mm -hmm. uh, through a one tala cycle long melody, a tune, a lenera that is played over and over and over. <coughs> a fine drummer whose sense of the tala was utterly embodied, as yours obviously is, um, would not have depended on hearing the lehera. Mm -hmm. I mean, it, yeah. yeah, right? And um, I always took it to be a socio-musical element of the solo. Explain. I'm coming. <laughs> I worked on how to say this. Any member of the audience could focus on the letter at the outset of the solo, understand the articulation of the tala, and thereafter, through the solo, keep the tala themselves. Um, Never happened. Even when the soloist went into raptures, of marvelously complex play with and against the tala, yeah. right? Or if you lost concentration, you're a member of the audience and you lost the tala and you wanted to come back to it, 
You could do that. The Lehera was for the audience, in essence, the way I always imagined it. So we could more easily experience that excitement of listening for how the soloist is going to come to a cadential sum mm -hmm. on count one, for example, because we could tell where count one was. <laughs> <laughs> um, and the Lehera was a major factor in the possibility for intellectual interaction between the musicians. This and is a question? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> You've been talking for almost time. <laughs> you have to be patient because of you. <laughs> okay. So I see this as a kind of social interaction as well as musical. Okay. And a trait that has been so, that interaction has been so important in Hindustani Absolutely. classical music, okay. But now the letter seems largely to have disappeared. It has. Well, I have seen concerts after concerts and video, and there is no letter. For Tobo Solo? Yes. And my reaction to that as a member of the audience is loss. It's loss. And I would appreciate your speaking to how you perceive that Lara as a tabla player, uh -huh. and and you don't seem to think it's disappeared. Oh no, not at all. Uh -huh. I, f I feel yeah. that it's it's really um, actually made an incredible resurgence. Yeah, if nothing I'm else. I'm very glad to hear you say that because <laughs> it has not been my experience. I attended a concert in Michigan three weeks ago, and there was a, a tabla player. He's a pretty good tough I mean, player. come on, it's Michigan. Ann Arbor. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and he played for, for 20 minutes. He played for 20 minutes? There was no Lara. Okay. And, and no, but that, that was just one instance okay. of there being no Lara. Okay. And so, um, I, I... Maybe you couldn't afford we, a Lara. <laughs> <laughs> no, he could have used the. Now you have letter boxes. I know, I know, I know, but so it wasn't happening. It wasn't happening. But uh, I, hundred percent of the tabla concerts that I've heard, and now you're talking about tabla concerts. It's it's a different thing when you are part of a say when Ravi Shankar used to play concerts, and my father Adaraka accompanied him. Ravi Ji would do a piece, then he'd do another piece, a lap, jor jara, and then a, another piece, and then there would be time for a tabla so. And then Ravi Shankar Ji would explain what the rhythm cycle, etc., etc., and then he would keep time. Absolutely. Yeah. And, and my father would play. No letter. Hmm. He would keep time. Oh, but play. yes, okay. Yeah, that but that was an articulation yeah. of the talk. Yeah, but that was like a 10, 15 minute, 18, 20 minute thing. Right. But when you are in India, and even here, I find that when there are regular tabla solo concert, and I mean a full concert, mm -hmm. an hour and a half or so, whatever it is, it's never without a lera. I'm so glad it's, to hear it's, that. It's always, am I right, tabla players? Yes. Yeah. 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 Mm -hmm. uh, I said tabla yeah, players, not saxophone players. <laughs> <laughs> so yes, it's, I, I mean, there are some really fine lera players now. I mean, uh, you talk about even harmonium for it's Ajay Joglika, yeah. Tanmay. Uh, then there is uh, uh, Ramesh Mishra ji, uh, Sultan Khan Sahib's son Sabir Khan, uh, his nephew Dilshad Khan, uh, various other uh, Murad. There are many accompanists who now accompany. And nowadays, you you know what's fun for me is to see is that there are more and more and more and more tabla solo concerts happening in India. Mm, good. I mean, quite a few, and there, and, and there are so many fabulous tabla players who are playing concerts and, and playing tabla solo. It's, it's really heartening for me to see that. And, and, and it's, it's amazing, because I'm, I mean, 45 years ago, there would be a solo by Pandit Shanta Vrshadji, or Pandit Kishan Maharajji, my father was Salalaraka, Ustad Tirakwa Khan Sahib, maybe Amir Hussain Khan Sahib, Abibuddin Khan Sahib. Rarely you heard a solo from Karamatullah Khan Sahib. That's pretty much, that was it. And, or on the radio station you heard a 15-minute tabla solo 
and so on. But nowadays, there are regular tabla solo concerts. Mm -hmm. Concerts like nobody else but tabla. Mm -hmm. and, and they are uh, fully attended, concert halls are full, mm -hmm. and people are listening to two hours of tabla being pounded upon. <laughs> and, you know, really loving it, enjoying it, and, and you know, having real intimate understanding of that instrument and, and, and following it. So yes, lera is a very important thing. I don't think that the audiences tie into the lera as much. What they tie into is the arrival to the sum of the lera. Yeah. They listen they don't listen to the rest of the melody. There's a those four notes. They will listen, they will wait for those four notes. The rest of the time whatever else is going on, nobody cares. <laughs> It's like the Khayal singer who would wait for Iktal, he'll wait for that Tere Ki So that's 9 and 10 and and then pick up the, the melody from 11 and 12. Up till then the singer would just be uh, <laughs> <laughs> uh, Where is that Tere Ki <laughs> We all have this. Um, most of the time the tabla player is playing and it is totally oblivious to where the lera is. Because he's got the time. I mean his body is the time. It's inside, it's right there. And because and this is where you can see the pedigree of a lera player, a good lera player. Because when a tabla player is playing and he's seeing the composition go. And then he's noticing that it's really not cutting it at this point and he's going to probably go like this. A good Lera player will fit right in and follow. You know, a good Lera player, you know, it's like a, you know, Tour de France bicycle race. And you, you know, the, the front guy is, is playing with the wind. You're going to go and, and fall right into it so that you don't get the that kind of a wind stoppage, let the other guy deal with it and it just follow through. A Lera player would do that. So, there's no point in me as a tabla soloist worrying about where the Lera player is. And the reason for that is because I have total confidence in the Lera player's ability to be able to see what's going on. Just like the tabla player who has studied the vocal music, studied the repertoire, and, and knows where to put the accents in a song, the Lehra player has studied the tabla repertoire. And when he hears the kaida being played, it's going on. Okay, but in the meantime, if I'm going in that area and suddenly I find that okay, I'm introducing tishra or triplets in here, but the tempo is not quite right, and I'm going to put it back a tad, the letter player falls right in there without being told. And for me, to have a Lera player, that I can have that kind of confidence. So for a tabla concert, Lera player is the chauffeur. He's the chauffeur. He's got, he's got that thankless job of not only playing that melody over and over again, God, do I have to play <laughs> You know, there are certain tabla players when a Lera player goes and, and, and ornaments it a little bit, they look at him and say, hmm, what's that all? I mean, that does happen, but most most tabla players will only have le a lehra players who they are confident. That you can select your lehra player. Yes, you can. And, and who they are confident of, that, of their ability of being able to recognize compositions, recognize repertoire, recognize how the rhythm is moving, the chand is moving, and being able to stay with it. And, and so, 
you know, th those are hard to come by. There are a few of them. And, and, and they are the, that's why you didn't have a lab up there in Michigan. Well, very <laughs> possible. No, it's very possible, although they imported Chinese instruments. Instrumentalists from China. <laughs> so, um, okay. We have a little time left. And yes. All right. Yes. Oh, I really appreciate how you perceive. No, here's a microphone. You should say your name too or something. So I know. Pahul Meet Singh. How? Pahul Meet Singh. Pahul? Yeah. Oh, wow. <laughs> Thank you. Sir, I appreciate it. How you perceive. I just said, oh, wow, I wasn't a picture. <laughs> <laughs> uh, <that's good. laughs> I really appreciate how you perceive the Bish Gar. Okay. Uh, but I would like to ask her, uh, what advice would you give to the young students of Tabla who perform solo nowadays? Well, this is a very tricky area because without having heard you, I cannot give you an advice because I have no idea of your ability or capabilities. And so I can't tell you, okay, do this or do that in terms of technical information, unless I see you play and see how your hands is and all that stuff. But in a general way, I can tell you how I feel and what is important to me. Uh, tabla playing, Tabla practicing, tabla thinking, tabla listening, all that, it's not a chore. It's not work to me. It's, it's, it's something that I look forward to. It's an enjoyment. It's a labor of love. It's the greatest playpen in the world. It's the best toy that anyone could ever have, etc., etc. I mean, so that makes being involved in it 24-7 quite fun. It's it's not monotonous, it's not boring, it's not it's not getting up at before dawn to milk the cow, you know, it's none of that stuff. But it's it's really something that I look forward to. It's a relationship uh, uh, that you know uh, is is something that's very special and, and very exciting. And I, I, I and and I'm thankful to God that uh, it has been for all these years and it hasn't in any way waned. So that's what needs to happen with you. This instrument, or any instrument, has a spirit. There's a spirit in here. We believe that. We firmly believe that. And half the battle is to be able to befriend and have that spirit accept you. And that means that connection of love, that relationship must be established. That's half the battle. If that is done, then, you know, it's at your beck and call. You know, it's like riding a horse. Once you establish a relationship with that horse, then you're one with it. And, and the horse knows exactly what you want. And, and, and just a little suggestion from you will allow the horse to either go right or go left or jump as an equestrian or whatever. So this <coughs> kind of relationship with the instrument, any instrument, I mean, when Vilayat Khansa played the sitar, you could see that the instrument was looking at him and saying, what would you like me to do? <laughs> Command me and I'll do it. You know, and, and that's a relationship which is unbelievable. Same thing with Ustad Ali Akbar Khansa. There was no limit to their relationship and what they could have accomplished together. So I feel that you must first establish that relationship of love and excitement with your instrument. If that happens, then everything else should not be that more difficult at all. Thank you, sir. Okay. Yes. Uh, uh, so given how your... Uh, given how you picked up Tabla through, the, through your formative years and you continue to do so, how has that or how, how has that uh, affected your uh, how does that how does that influence your teaching philosophy and to your I mean or imparting your knowledge of tabla to your students? Well, and, first, yeah. first of all, I don't think I don't consider myself a teacher. Okay. I'm more of a guide. Yeah. Okay. I I, I don't believe in uh, in taking students. Whoever comes to me and wants some information and some guidance. In the name of my father, I give it to him. 
And uh, so there's no bar like you can't have it or you can't have it. Everybody, it's open and available to everybody. Uh, uh, the process of teaching for me is like I was explaining the Peshka. It's, it's just as much visual as it is audio. You know, I, uh, I talk to my students and I explain it the same way. Uh, uh, if I'm explaining a composition, I, I try to create a visual picture for them. And for me, that becomes important. Like, so I said, imagine a deer, a deer moving in the forest looking for food. Okay? Watches a hunter, sees a hunter and gets startled. And then runs away. A deer runs a certain way. So, I mean, creating a visual picture is very important. Like, So, what is this? It's an invitation. You know, come to this lecture, you know, <laughs> sit down, get a drink, get something to eat, get relaxed, listen to the lecture and go home. Right? <laughs> then listen to the lecture and then go home. Visual pictures. I mean, you have to create that in order to be able to make some sense out of compositions. Right? So, if you, you think about game, you think about, you know, uh, I don't know how to describe this. If I'm doing a rela, you know, imagine a snake. You know, visual pictures. So I try to do that so that it's it's uh, it appears uh, and and becomes visible, and and that's what I do when I'm playing a concert as well. If I'm playing here, you know, if I'm just playing, sorry, now you're hearing it, it's clear, it's fine, it's fine. But what if I can make it visual for you? Okay. It's here. It's not just here. Somebody back there can't see my hands, but they can see my body move. They can see my hands just said. I don't have to do that. I can do that. But it's just a visual, you know, ex exclamation mark as to, you know, wh where the composition is, what it's doing and the graph. So the, that's the kind of thing that I like to teach a student, you know, because after all, this is a performance art. So perform. You know, that's how my father taught me. He didn't, you know, he would talk to me for years together about music and rhythm and compositions and everything. But when he finally sat down to play with me, he wouldn't say a word. It was a performance. He played, I had to respond. If I couldn't keep up, fine, that's your problem. So that's basically it, okay? Okay, we have heard the bells chime. You know, the gentleman has been raising his oh, hand yes. like... Are you willing to I'm delay your dinner? Okay. For that t-shirt, okay. yes. <laughs> Uh, if we listen to two different records of Bala Gandharva, yes. it feels as if there are two different Gandharvas are singing. Okay. So can you uh, point out any instrumentalist uh -huh. with similar abilities? Karina Yadu Mane Sadhana. You know this, right? Yeah, of course. <laughs> Bala Gandharva. Bala Gandharva was a very famous performer of Marathi Natyas. Really amazing. In fact, it, I would have to say you must credit him singularly for 
keeping alive and nurturing Indian classical music in Maharashtra. Okay, we talked about that. Uh, we talked about that yeah. on Thursday as well. Bal Gandharva was also a person who played female roles mm -hmm. on stage. Very, very amazing. And one of the great tabla maestros of our, that we all bow down to, Ustad Thirakwa Khasa used to accompany him mm -hmm. in his plays, in his nakas. <coughs> That's an amazing thing. So he obviously was many personalities, not just two. I mean, he could be a woman, he could be a man, he could be... A uh, Dev, he could be a villain, he could be a romantic, he could be all sorts of things and he was able to uh, convey that through his character, through his music and, and, and everything. I would have to say that when you listen to someone like say uh, Kishori Yamonkar, you get the feeling that that life itself manifests in the way she presents her music. When you listen to Ustad Amir Khansa, mm -hmm. you get that same feeling. You have many layers of personality, of humanity in general, that appears forth right there in front of you when you listen to someone like Ustad Amir Khansa. Uh, you get the similar feeling of certain regions of India from someone like say, Ustad Bade Gulam Ali Khansa you will hear Pahadi or you will hear some Bhairavi of very special Punjabi young and you will see that that person not only has appeared to you as a classical khayal singer but as, as a beautiful woman filling her ceramic pot with water at the river Chanab or Ravi and you, that picturization is very clear. You're looking at this humongous person with great mustache <laughs> sitting there, uh, and yet that person appears as a beautiful, beautiful, you know, you know, woman in front of you. Uh, Shambhu Maharaj, a great Kathak dancer, who was quite ugly to look at, <laughs> in somewhat. And he was a man, but when he got on stage and had time, and, and he played a woman, you lost yourself. You were totally, you know, attracted to this beautiful female, and he, who was a man standing there doing the Achan Maharaj did the same thing. He was a humongous, a big Kathak dancer, Birju Maharaj's father. Mm -hmm. And when, he, but he got, got on stage. And it, and it was grace personified. I mean, it was just amazing to see this kind of transformation take place. It wasn't the human being. It was the power of the art. It was the power of the music, the dance, the rhythms that uh, really revealed uh, a whole different layer of this person. So yes, there are many, I can say that. Okay? Thank you, Thank you very much. Anyway, I have to, you know, this uh, little, little time that I'm spending on this campus is really a very special, precious moment for me. I'm really enjoying myself here, and uh, I have to thank the powers that be for really working hard to make this possible for me to come here, and, and to people like Bani and Raka and uh, uh, Punita and, and everybody else uh, breaking their backs and trying to get these days and, and all the activities planned around it and especially the dinner. <laughs> so thank you. We have one more event uh, tomorrow uh, from 7 to 9 in Hertz Hall. He is going to guide um, in a master class. Uh, students in his uh, other life, jazz and jazz fusion, um, and a member of uh, the music faculty, a very distinguished jazz pianist, Myra Melford, will be uh, more, or less in <laughs> more or less in charge of that, so we invite you to come. There's plenty of space in a very large concert hall. Okay, thank you for coming. And thank you again.